Hello, once again, thanks for joining us. We're back in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 15, in our study of the wilderness wanderings as we wander our way through the book of Numbers. And we're going to be uh, picking up in verse 22 this week where we left off in our last session and finishing out the, uh, the chapter in Numbers 15. Many times in our life we're really uh, forced to deal with the harshness of reality, to take a, a good hard look at life. The other night we were at a parents' meeting for uh, my daughter. She's playing on a, a volleyball club. And the coach just uh, happened to take the time to say, okay, ladies, w- let's, just, let's talk about something very specific. She, he said to them, if you're planning right now, you think you're ready to just go up to Penn, Penn State main campus and just jump on the volleyball team. He said, let's just let that balloon sail up in the air and let's burst it right now. And he, he wasn't saying that they weren't good enough to, to play at whatever level. He was just looking at them and saying, right now in your life, you are not at that level. So don't come in here. And he was saying it to the parents too. Don't come in here and act like your girl is the best player ever to walk on a volleyball court. This is where they're at. They're at this age level and we're going to play and train. He said, if you're ready to want to improve your skills to play for your high school and do better in that, that area, then great. Let's plan that way. Let's do that. But he made them take that harsh look, made us as parents take that, that real look, the hard look of life and saying, where are our daughters at right now? Well, a lot of times in life, we are forced to take the hard look, to take the hard look day by day and say, where are we at? What is the reality of the situation that we are currently in? And in Numbers 15, God is going to have the children of Israel take a hard look at themselves. He's going to remind them of where they were. When we look at Numbers 15, we remember very clearly where they were at. They are at the point where they are facing the hard reality of discipline. They are uh, told they are no longer going to enter into the promised land. And now there is this heartache of hopelessness. And we talked about that last time. Will, Will God graciously comfort them as they're hurting. They may be wondering, will he still be with them even after rebellion? Will God care for them? He's going to leave them to die in the wilderness. Will God keep his commands or his promises that he made to their ancestors, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, to give them this land? And as they they wrestle with all of those thoughts, God reminded them that I am still going to be faithful because of Moses' intercession for the people, because of God's patience, because of God's long-suffering, he says that he will, but there's still this feeling of grief, the feeling of loss, the feeling of remorse encircling the camp. And now the Jews are faced with the hard look at life. What is going to happen? The reality of the moment for them is this generation, numbers of them have lost the right to enter into the promised land. But God graciously reminds them of his relationship relationship with the righteous. And we saw that in verses 1 through 21, how God was going to abundantly provide for them in that land and how he was going to pour out his grace upon them. They were going to be able to offer all these offerings and sacrifices to him as a wonderful outpouring of God's abundant blessing in their life. But when we look at our lives and we have to take the hard look, the hard look for us is often not the look that says, okay, I'm in a relationship with God. What is God doing for me right now? But the hard look often comes in what is necessary to maintain the fellowship with God. My relationship with God is secure in him and through Christ. But my fellowship with God can be severed, can struggle. And God is going to force the Israelites to look at their fellowship with him. He's going to take the second half of this chapter and face the hard reality, the hard look of life that says, how do we as sinners, how do we interact in the realm of a relationship with God? We have this relationship, we live in this sphere, in the realm of God's relationship. And yet within that, some of us are stagnant, some of us are shriveling up, some are growing in God's grace. But what happens when we find ourselves 
when we take that hard look and we say, ugh, things are not where they ought to be. My heart attitude, my mouth, my thoughts, my actions, they're not in a good spot. How do I, how do I remedy that? How do I work through it? We have to remember the hard look Even though I'm righteous before God, I have been justified. Even though the Jews have this right standing in a covenant relationship with God, there is still a battle with sin. We still face that. That's hard to swallow. It's hard to admit sometimes that I'm a sinner who struggles with sinning. And all of that sin requires atonement. It requires the covering of blood. It required for the Jews many sacrifices. It required for us the one ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we look and we have this atonement, but the fellowship with our holy God is only possible if those sins are atoned for. If there was no atonement for Jesus, by Jesus Christ, we would continually be bringing sacrifices. But Christ did that. Christ offered that. And we have that ability of fellowship. But forgiveness of sins is necessary to maintain that fellowship in our relationship. In order for me to continually grow in my, re- my fellowship with God, I must have this perpetual forgiveness of sins. Yes, my sins are covered through the blood of Jesus Christ at salvation. But when I am battling in my life and I sin, I have to confess my sins, come back to him. And ask him for forgiveness. Well, the Jews were reminded of the same thing. Their covenant relationship with God as a nation never changed. But to maintain their fellowship with him, to remain, remain in that relationship correctly, they had to be bringing sacrifice. And the second half is going to look at that. In fact, pick up with me in verse 22, where it says, And if you have erred and not observed all the commandments which the Lord has spoken unto Moses, even all, or all that the Lord hath commanded you by the hand of Moses, from the day that the Lord commanded Moses, and henceforth among your generations. So he looks and he says, if you have erred or you have sinned, is the idea, and you've not observed all these commands. You've not observed which commands? Not just the ones like the, he just gave in the earlier part, of Numbers 15. But he says, all the commands from the day that the Lord commanded Moses, from Mount Sinai on, the law that was given to Moses, the Mosaic law, they were required to obey. And when they were not, and when they erred, what were they to do? It it wasn't just an instant, like, chuck them out of camp, kill them, stone them, they're all done. There there were some things that happened here. There was a process that would, would occur in their life. Now, when we look at this passage here, when we look at these next verses, repetition is key. And whenever you're doing your Bible study and you are reading through a passage and you see words, main words, not A or, you know, I, sometimes I, but you, you, you see these words and they repeat two or three or four or five, six times in a, in a small section. Take note of that. In fact, you're going to see that in verses 22 to 29. You're going to see the word sin repeated three or four times here. The word ignorance. You're going to see it in verses 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. Uh, It should key you off that, ooh, there's probably something about that word in this passage that's important. The word for offering or sacrifice is used multiple times. Atonement, forgiven. Now you look at all those, all those words and they're, they're words that some of them we don't like, but most of them we're really thankful for, or at least I hope you are. That when you sin, even if you sin ignorantly, which we'll talk about here in a second, there is an offering, there is a sacrifice that has been made or can be made for the atonement and the forgiveness of your sins. And so God is gonna walk the children of Israel through and say, hey, when you sin. And he's going to specifically deal with, in this passage, starting here, the sins of ignorance. He's going to look and say, when you break God's law, and we talk about ignorance. Now, if you're like me, you sort of grew up or you understood, like, can we really ever have an ignorant sin? One that we really didn't know we did? Because sin rarely is devoid of intent. It usually has some sort of impetus or some sort of choice that is there. At some level, we all invariably know, we're well aware that what we are doing 
is wrong. Even if it starts innocently, ignorantly is a better word, not innocently, ignorantly, there comes a point where you're like, yeah, what I'm doing is not right. For me, a lot of times the battle is my temper, my mouth. I won't intend to get feisty with my words, but there'll come a point where I find myself just digging in now because it's like, all right, I'm already into it. I'm going to ask to ask forgiveness anyway, so I'm going to win this fight. That's not right. There comes a point where we know what we're doing is wrong. And yet, in here, in the Old Testament, right here in this passage, we're going to see that God is going to make a distinction between ignorance sin and open defiance sin. He's going to talk about the two extremes here in this passage. So he does highlight that there is an ignorant type of sin. We see the difference uh, in our society. If you're convicted of manslaughter versus murder, you know, picture yourself, you're driving down your car, in your car, you're speeding along, probably going a little more than you should, and you reach down to, to change the radio or to change your playlist on your phone so that you can have something different. When all of a sudden you hear this thud, and your heart sinks because you know what that was. You pull over and you realize that you just hit, you, you drove through a, a crosswalk and you hit a pedestrian and you killed the pedestrian. And you know at that point, things are not good for you. Was that murder or was that manslaughter? We look at our laws, there's going to be, you're going to get charged with manslaughter involuntary. Your intent was not to go out and kill somebody with your car but through your choices of speeding and changing and not paying attention to the road, but changing the radio or uh, adjusting or doing something on your phone, that happened. And so you be, you're still culpable for the death of the individual, though it was not something that you set out intentionally to do. That's the idea of the ignorant sin. It happens because of choices you made. It happens because you started down a path that... You, it wasn't intentional to lead to sin, but you found yourself in that. That's why wisdom becomes such a big thing because wisdom, as Proverbs talks about it, it's take, being able to take that longer look and saying, if I do go down that path, I could end up in those situations. But the intention was not to jump right into sin. It was just through some choices and through some of the things that happened, you found yourself being guilty of sin. And so God addresses that with the nation, that if you end up in the situation, he says, there's there. There are many times in our lives that our sin falls under the category of carelessness, that we're just not thinking about it. We're not thinking about God. And so because we're not remembering him and his ways, we find ourselves drifting and all of a sudden we're doing something. We're like, how did I get here? Why did this happen? And it, it's from a careless attitude, a careless disrespect. We don't set out with the intent of saying cruel words or hitting somebody who really annoys us. It's sort of, you know, to jump in. I, I, most of us don't jump in and say, hey, this morning I'm going to plan to have three lustful thoughts before the morning even starts. And yet sometimes you find yourself there. Or proud thoughts or arrogant, like I'm so much better than that. And then you're like, wait, why did that just pop into my head? Why did I do that? And we find ourselves battling with some of those sinful thoughts, sinful, sinful ideas, but not with the intent to just jump in and do it. They just sort of happen in our carelessness, in our thoughtlessness. We see that in one sense, that idea of it just happened was that careless act of thoughtlessness. The, these sins, they flow out of the war, really is what happens, where Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7, again in Galatians chapter 6, where they flow out of the battle that is in us, our sin nature and our transformed heart. We want to live righteously, and yet at times we find ourselves wallowing in the mire of sin. And the, the sin nature and our transformed heart are battling back and forth and the things we don't want to do, we do, and the things we do want to do, we don't do. And we find ourselves at times in sin that we never intended ourselves to be in. So what does God say to do? Do you just look and say, well, I really didn't intend to do it, so it's really not that big of a deal. He says to Israel, you're going to have to address this. You're going to need to do this because you're still culpable for that sin. Unintentionality thoughtlessness, carelessness, or whatever other reason we want to give to our sin, it does not release us from the responsibility of our actions. 
So as we look at this passage, you'll see all those different times when you read through it on your own there. The different times where if ought be committed by ignorance, verse 24. Again, down in verse 25, for it is ignorance. For their ignorance at the very end of the verse, the people were in ignorance. If any soul through ignorance, verse 27. These different sins that occur in our life because of our carelessness, our thoughtlessness, and, and that's really important to be thinking about. As I'm not thinking about God, as I'm not dwelling on him, it is so much easier for me to find myself being careless about my actions, my habits, my thoughts. But as I'm dwelling on God and I'm reminding myself of God, it helps me to remember who God is, what he wants me to do, his commands, his laws. And God's going to bring that full circle in this passage when we wrap up. You'll see how, it, how the passage wraps up and tells us, don't be careless in your thoughts, but remember God. Make it practical. But we'll get there in a second. We are responsible for those careless thoughts. We are. We can't just say, well, they just sort of popped into my head and I guess it's not my fault anyway. God put them there. No. They are part of my sin nature. They are part of my reaction. I have to deal with them because sin is still sin. Whatever its source. And all sin needs atonement. It needs to be covered. It needs the shedding of blood. It needs forgiveness. We do not continue in our fellowship while we are wallowing in our sin. And so we, we strongly desire to sin and we strongly desire to have forgiveness of sins and that battle goes back and forth, but we need to continually go to God to restore our fellowship. So you see the repetition of the ignorance and the sin. Well, the repetition continues when you see the words of offering and sacrifice that are going to take place. There's going to be, verse 24, a burnt offering, a meat offering, a drink offering, the sin offering, that there's going to be a sacrifice in verse 25 for their sin offering before the Lord. Verse 27, there's going to be a sin offering, and you're, you're going to see this happening continually. That God says, hey, there are certain specific sacrifices necessary for you the Jews in the Old Testament, in this specific case, that were necessary for the nation or the individual. In verses 24 to 26, he's talking to the congregation. If you as a congregation have found yourself committing an ignorant sin, you weren't planning, but you as a nation did this, you need to have this type of atonement, this type of sacrifice. If you as an individual, verses 27 to 29, find yourself dealing with the sin of ignorance, some sort of sin that you're in, you ignorantly, carelessly, thoughtlessly found yourself in that, but that's where you're at. He says, hey, you need to deal with it. We, on the flip side of the cross, we look back and we say, yes, the, the, we don't have differential or differentiated sacrifices where I have to bring a, a bull for this and a goat for this. It's all through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But I have a responsibility that if I can commit sin that I am going to confess my sins so that God through his faithfulness and his justness will forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from that unrighteousness through the blood of Jesus Christ, I still have that responsibility to be bringing my, my repentance to God through prayer and through confession. Now, the other word that comes up is the word atonement. It comes up a number of times in the passage. The priest was to take the sacrificial offering of the individuals, and when they brought it with a proper attitude by the offer, they come with a heart of contrition, a heart of remorse, a heart of repentance, then the proper atonement ritual would be applied. The Levites would do their thing. The priests would do their thing. And the, through the shedding of blood, there was the, the feeling or the, the thought of the forgiveness of sins. And so then the individual said, okay, my sin is taken care of before God because I've come with this proper attitude. I have offered the proper sacrifice, what God has said, how God has said to do it. I am following to be in a right relationship to restore my fellowship with God. And so that happens as they go through. And the, the result is the forgiveness of sins. We see that. And it's important to, to note because when we, we're going to jump over to Leviticus in a few moments here. But you'll see at the end of uh, verse 25, it's, or in the middle of it, and it shall be forgiven them. And then it goes on again, verse 26. It says, and it shall be forgiven them. And verse 28, 
and it shall be forgiven them. You see that when there is sin and there is an atoning sacrifice that is made, the result is the forgiveness of sins. So even in the Old Testament, sometimes we get this idea of everything so different. But the overarching theme, sin needs a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice to be atoned for, and the result is forgiveness of sins. Even in the New Testament, our sin needed a blood sacrifice, Jesus Christ, to atone for sins so that our sins could be forgiven. There's this beautiful picture of just forgiveness. So as the individual or the nations were forgiven, because of the atoning work of the priests and their sacrifice, their fellowship was restored. So God is telling them, take the hard look at your life. There are times in your life where you're going to find yourself in sin. Your relationship has not been broken, but your fellowship is damaged. You need to take the hard look, swallow the pride, and get on your knees and repent of your sins before God. So he tells them that because the necessity of forgiveness and atonement was not simply for the Jews, but it was for any who would enter into this relationship with God. It is important for all of us. In verses 28 and 29, it goes back to that idea of the stranger, the gear, the one who has, is not Jewish by blood, but is now living with the people. They've adopted the ways of Israel. They've adopted their God. They've adopted the practices of their religion. And they're saying, we want to follow Jehovah. We want to worship him. And so God says, for anyone, Jew or Gentile, this is what must happen. There must be a shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins. We see that throughout scripture. And we're thankful that the shed blood of Jesus Christ is enough to, shed, uh, to cover our sins for us. Now, the passage is going to hit rock bottom. It's going to get pretty low in verses 30 to 31. And you look at it, and you go from these sins of ignorance to something completely different. The nation's rebellion and rejection of the promised land was ultimately, as we talked about, it was a rejection of God. And why would God so uh, vehemently decide to get rid of them all. What was it? It was because of their attitude. It was because of their high-handed rejection of God. Do you remember back in Numbers 14, verse 44? The hard heart, even after they felt remorse because God said, you're not going into the land, they said, well, we're going to go take the land anyway. We're going to go against the Amalekites. We're going to go against the Canaanites, and we're going to take them on because we're going to go. And Moses says, God's not going with you on this one. And they, what did they do? Verse 44, but they presumed to go up to the hilltop. They took it upon themselves and said, we don't want, we, you may say that's what God's gonna do. We're gonna do what we're gonna do. Look in verse 30 of chapter 15. It says, but the soul that doeth ought presumptuously. That word that is going to be used here, God is going to speak to them about their individual, not even the national, now individual, he says the soul, the individual soul that rebels and rejects with a high hand against God, he says, we're gonna deal with them. Whether they be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord. And that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Because he hath despised the word of God, the word of the Lord, and hath broken his commandments, that soul shall utterly be cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. His sin is his own responsibility. Notice what is not given in these verses for that individual. Do you, do you catch? Think about what was repeated before. We see nothing about a sacrifice, we see nothing about atonement we see nothing about forgiveness of sins. All we see is this type of individual is going to be dealt with and their sin is on their head. Now, it, it got me thinking and started to really wrestle with, okay, God is going to deal here with remorseless rebellion of the unrighteous individual. How, how does this play out? The section focuses on presumptuous sins, once again, for the stranger and the Jews. The sin is the account, uh, in this account is the, in direct contrast to the sins that are inadvertent. Total opposite end of the spectrum from what we just talked about in verses 22 through 29. 
Here God is now speaking to those who are sinning presumptuously. The idea of sinning with a high hand, a raised clenched fist, boldly in defiance against God. I mentioned it a few weeks back, but that symbol of the raised fist, when you really look through it, through history, it is a constant symbol of rebellion. It is a constant symbol of we want nothing to do with the authority that is above us. It is the pumping of the fist. It is the get out of my life and I'm going to do it myself. And there is that, that aspect. Well, that's the, the wording that's being used here for presumptuous is this idea of the raised fist against God. It is the one where the sinner considers God completely irrelevant for the future. In other words, I really don't care what you got, God. I don't care what you're gonna do. I'm gonna live what I wanna do and whatever consequences you're going to bring into my life, okay, so be it. I guess I'll accept it. That's a dangerous place to be in. And yet we find people there. They're sinning with eyes wide open in ultimate rebellion and they know full well what they are doing. Now, as we look at that, God is going to say, for those people, I'm going to cut them off. There is no sacrifice for their sin. Does that, do you, do you struggle with that concept for a second? Like, wait, how can there not be a sacrifice? Are, are there sins that we can commit that, that you know, God won't forgive? Is that, is that really there? Because all he gives us are ignorant sins, like where I accidentally walked into it, or I find myself carelessly sinning. And then you get on this end, and what do you have? You have sin that they know they're doing, and because they choose to do it, now there's no, there's no forgiveness of that. There's no uh, ability to take care of it through the shed blood. If you're like me, that scares me a little bit. Because I find myself at times in my life, willfully, with full knowledge of what I am doing, entering into sin. I find myself in just a sinful, wallowed state, looking and saying, I'm gonna do that. I'm going to choose to sin. So if Numbers 15 is only giving us two extremes, where one is ignorant, careless, okay, it happened, the other is a willful choice to enter into sin, I find myself in a pretty bad spot. But Leviticus is gonna help us here. Numbers is gonna give us the extremes. Leviticus is gonna help fill in some of, the, some of the blanks. Go over with me to Leviticus chapter four, five, six. We're not gonna cover it all, don't worry. Uh, I just wanna hit some highlights from it. But Numbers chapter four, five, and it should say six as well because we're gonna go through six, verse seven. Uh, the context here is dealing with individuals that are sinning. Now you're gonna notice if you look in chapter four, verse 27, right away, something's gonna ring true. And if any one of the common people, so it's not talking about the priests, it's not talking about the Levites, it's not talking about the leadership, now it's talking about people in general. If they sin through, see the word? ignorance. So verses 27 through 20, uh, 35, you're going to see that it's going to be very similar to what we just talked about in Numbers 14 verses 22 through uh, 29. We're dealing with the sins of ignorance, the, the unintentional careless thoughts that we find ourselves in those situations. What happens? Notice in verse 28, or if a person is sin, sins, which he has sinned, and then it came to his knowledge, like all of a sudden he realized, oh, wait a second, this was not right. Someone brings it to his attention and says, hey, that action, that thing you did there, that was, that was not good. So it's brought to their attention. Even if it's that type of ignorance where now you know about it, what are they to do? Verse 31, they're to bring offerings and the priest shall make an atonement, remember that, and it shall be forgiven him. So there's that repeat of the sins of ignorance. Now, if you go down to chapter five, verses one through 13, it's going to be brought about even more clearly when sin is brought to light. When you're living in sin, and let's be honest, is this not a hard look? How many of you, like me, really love it when somebody comes and says, hey, Art, right, you really shouldn't have done that. That was wrong. You know, our first is I clench the fist, the heart starts beating. I start, you know, biting my lower lip. And I'm like, who are you to tell me that I'm doing something? You know, and, and our nature builds up. 
But God says, hey, when somebody comes to you and it's brought to light, your sin is brought to light, you've, you've trespassed against somebody and you didn't realize it, but now it's brought to light uh, in your situation, to your attention. You trespassed and you didn't realize it, but now you've recognized. And he goes through all those different things. And uh, verse three, it's hid from him, but now he knows of it. Verse four, he knows not and knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty. He didn't know it before, but now he knows it. Look at verse five. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he will confess that he has sinned in a thing. And then he's going to bring verse six, a trespass offering. And notice at the end of verse six, an atonement for him concerning his sin is going to be made. And at the end of verse 10, it shall be forgiven him. So again, going through that process, Leviticus is filling in the gaps between those extremes of the situations where you entered into sin, now it's brought to light. Now you know about it. Are you in this willful defiance against God or do you realize there's guilt? And do you take care of it? You keep going in verse 14. It says, and Moses, the Lord speaks to Moses, if a soul commits a trespass and a sin through, here it is again, ignorance, okay? But now he's gonna talk about against the holy things and against the priest. Verse 17, and if a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commands of the Lord, though he may not know it. So he's still initially talking about these sins of ignorance. He's saying, hey, notice, that is going to happen. There are going to be. It's amazing to me how many different times in the, in the Pentateuch it talks about these sins of ignorance. Because I believe God completely understands there are many times when we are not focused on him and we focus on ourselves and everything around us, where do we find ourselves? We find ourselves wandering into sin wandering away from God and moving towards sin. And God says, hey, when this happens, it's gonna be really easy to beat yourself up. Like, how did I do this again? He says, take care of it. Receive atonement, receive forgiveness for that sin. But look at verse six, or chapter six, verse number two. There's uh, some of the thought and intention. Notice what's going to be allowed here. There's going to be a focus on intentionality, more in chapter six, uh, verses one through seven, not four, chapter five. Chapter 5, 14 through uh, 8, 19 is dealing more with the sins of ignorance. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 7 is going to deal with what we're going to call intentional sin. Not the high-handed, in-your-face God, but there's going to be an intentionality where these people are going to make a choice. Look what they say. If a soul sins and commits a trespass against the Lord and lies to his neighbor... Neighbor, and that he wa- and that which was delivered him to keep. In other words, he lies to his neighbor about what he has, or he is going to steal something. There's thought that goes into that. We don't just you know randomly just decide to lie. No, there is an intentionality to the falsehood, to the lying that occurs, or to the stealing or the keeping away. Any of these things that the man does, they're sinning. At the end of verse three, it says. Then it shall be, because he has sinned and is guilty, he shall restore that which he violently took away or the thing which he had deceitfully gotten, what he had stolen or what he had made his own or that which was delivered to him to keep and he lost the thing that he's found and he wants to make things right uh, or that he swore an oath falsely. He said, I'll do this and then he doesn't do it. And he said in verse five, he shall restore the principle, add a fifth part more thereto and give it to him to who it appertaineth. In other words, he's going to make reparations or restitution to the individual that he wronged. So what happens here is there is an offering that's going to be made for this individual who intentionally sins against God. He breaks God's laws, violates them knowingly, and yet God says there is an offering. So that is different from Numbers 14 where you have this individual who there is no sacrifice offered for this person. You see that in Numbers cha- or Leviticus chapter 6, forgiveness is provided. Verse 7, and the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord, and it shall be forgiven him for anything of that which where he is done in trespassing therein. So God looks and says, Yes, I know you intentionally lied. Yes, you intentionally stole. Yes, you did these sins wrongly with intention, and yet I will forgive you. So the relationship, in order for it to be repaired in this passage, it talks about 
repentance and reparation, which I think is very important for us to remember that when we sin, especially when we sin against one another, that we make sure if there is some sort of reparation to be made, we make it. We don't just look and say, well, that's their loss. They shouldn't have probably trusted me in the first place. No, we make reparation. We make restitution for the wrongs that we have committed. So what's the difference between the intentional sin of Leviticus chapter 6 and the high-handed sin of Numbers chapter 14? Chapter 6, verse number 4, there is a, there's a wording in here. It talks about the guilty. It says, then it shall be, because he has sinned and is guilty. This word guilty here is not a declaration from above that you are guilty, but rather it is a guilt from within saying I was wrong. Their conscience is working on them. They are remorseful. They are understanding that what they have done when they realize who God is and God's holiness and they understand how they have violated their friend, their guilt works on them and they condemn themselves from within and that individual now feels that they have to receive repentance. The individuals in Leviticus not only feel remorse, but they're given to this idea they must be forgiven. When a guilty person came forward, they had to make confession, they had to pay those reparations, they had to bring an offering, and that was all an indication that the remorse that they had was producing the fruit of repentance. That they were willing to swallow their pride that they were willing to subserviently place themselves under God's way, that they were willing to offer these sacrifices, that they were willing to give these reparations and make restitution. All of that demonstrated the true fruit of repentance, that where I am, that what I did was wrong. For this individual, there's forgiveness of sins. That's what Leviticus talks about. Numbers 15, however, that person, the person who is sinning with the high hand, is making a conscious public decision to live and to reject the ways of God. To say, I'm not even worried. Now, yes, there are times at any point a person can come back to ask for forgiveness of God. We understand that. But when it comes to the end of that person's life and they are still high-handed against God, there is no forgiveness for that sin. It is a rejection of God, a rejection of his ways. And ultimately, if it's a rejection of his ways, it does not bode well for that individual. In fact, in Numbers chapter 15, verse 30, where it talks about the reproach of the Lord, the same reproach as the Lord. The word here often is referred to as abuse. It's used for abuse in other, other passages. You are abusing the Lord, abusing his ways, to have a disdain, verse 31, for his word, has the idea of to, to disregard it with great contempt. To walk into a courtroom, the judge says, sit there, and you decide to stand and say, no, I'm gonna do what I wanna do. The judge says, you're going to do it, or I'm gonna hold you in contempt. And you just stand there and say, I'm not gonna do, and you just, you, you basically puff your hand, puff out your chest and beat your hand against the judge and say, no. It's a contempt for their word. When we do that to God's word, we are finding ourselves in a very bad spot. In verse 31, again, it talks about and has broken his commandment. It's that re rebellion against God's word. It reminds me of 1 John chapter 2. This individual in, in Numbers chapter 15, verses 30, 31, who may be part of the children of Israel who may even know numbers of the laws and may even keep some of them, but in some of the ways they're just like, nope, you know what, God, I don't care. I'm gonna do my own thing. Remember what 1 John says? And hereby we know that we know him. How do we, how do we know? How do we have this assurance of our relationship with him? If we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, that person's a liar. And the truth is not in him. If the continual habit and pattern of an individual is to continually break God's ways, to reject God's authority, to beat their hand against the sky in rebellion and say, I'm gonna do what I wanna do and be what I wanna be, and God, I don't care about your consequences, that does not put that individual in a good spot. Treating God's word with this type of contempt 
it also means rejecting that relationship with God. Now, again, it's not that we can lose our salvation. But this is talking about if that is truly the individual's heart attitude, even if they prayed some prayer way back, but there is no genuine change of repentance, no attitude, no direction that is going, again, not sinlessness. We know there's going to be battles of sin. But if they continue down that path, this verse ought to cause us to pause. It ought to cause us great concern for maybe some of our children or some of our youth who've gone through the church here or some of our adult friends who are living openly and saying, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's, that's nerve-wracking. That's Matthew 18 makes it very, very real that we go to individuals in our church and say, hey, you're living in sin. This is not good. Let's, let's change it. But they continue down that path and how do we end up treating them as someone who's unsaved? They might, and they might be saved, and they might, but he says you treat them that way as a heathen because that's how they're acting. They're acting like this person in Numbers 15 who is just pushing themselves against God. And God gives an example. Moses brings to light an example that occurred in the wilderness. Now remember, all of this passage up until this point is talking about when you're in the land, when you're in the land. And following right after this idea of the presumptuous high-handed sin against God, we come across this example in verses 32 through 36 of the Sabbath breaker. The one who goes out on the Sabbath day of the children of Israel while they're in the wilderness, they find a man who's gathering sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they found him gathering sticks and they bring him to Moses and Aaron and unto the congregation and they put him in ward. In other words, they sort of locked him up because they weren't sure, are we supposed to do this? Are we really, are we putting to death somebody? We know it's very clear that Exodus talks about what's supposed to happen. The Sabbath laws were known and the keeping the Sabbath was not just for the land. It was before the land. It was before they got to the promised land. They were supposed to do it in the wilderness. In fact, the, the practice of the Sabbath was even before uh, before Egypt, there was this continual practice of taking a day to rest. We see it all the way back in the beginning of creation. So this principle of Sabbath rest, Sabbath worship was very common. And Exodus 20, 31, and 35, 35, yeah, 35, all cover the Sabbath law. So these Jews, this individual understood, they knew the Sabbath law, what they were supposed to be doing. And so you have this man who's out there breaking the Sabbath law very openly in front of everybody. It wasn't he was hiding. They saw him out in the wilderness doing this. So he was working, which was a violation. He was gathering the sticks and doing labor. And, and most understand it. Why are you gathering the sticks? It's probably to make a fire, which kindling a fire was a direct. Exodus 35 verse 3, a direct violation of what they were not supposed to do. So here is this man who high-handedly says, I am going to do what I want to do on the day of rest, on the Sabbath day that God has said to set aside, that God has said not to work on, that God has said not to build a fire, and I'm going to openly in front of everybody, I'm going to go do this sin. So what do they do? What is God's response? God's punishment for high-handed sin for this individual, in this case, in this time period in Israel, was stoning. That is what happens to this individual. He says, take the man out of the congregation. You're going to cut him off. You're going to move him outside of the camp. And what are you going to do? You're going to, all the congregation is going to stone him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. This was a direct directive from above. And so they stoned this man outside of the camp so that no, nothing in camp was going to be defiled by the dead body. It was outside of camp and done. God looks and says, I take this seriously. God takes high-handed, open, rebellious sin seriously. That practice of doing whatever it is very openly and defiantly, the open blasphemies against God, the open in public, I really don't think church is important and I don't care about God. Those statements, God takes that seriously because God says this is what you're supposed to be doing. The openness to accept in many churches, accept thoughts, theologies, cultural practices that are anti-God's word. God takes that seriously. We must be looking and saying, what does God's word say? 
And how do I practice it in a day in and day out situation? It's very obvious that God expects loyalty to his word and his way. If you sin, if you, if you find yourself walking away from my word and my way and you carelessly, ignorantly walk into sin, get right and get back to my way. If you are in high-handed, open rebellion against me, you're not in a good spot because I expect you to be loyal to my word, my ways. If you are intentionally finding yourselves battling with sin and sinning against God, God says, get that made right. Be right with me because I expect loyalty to my word, my way. He's provided us with the ability to maintain that fellowship through repentance, to be taking the hard look, the honest look, the real to life look at ourselves. And not looking, going, well, I'm a Baptist who comes to church all the time, so I must be really a good person. No. To look and say, I am a stinking sinner who battles and I want to make sure I'm right with God. To look through repentance and give that to God. The hard reality to face, we are sinners who through the sacrifice of Christ, we have a relationship with him. But just because I have a relationship does not mean that my friendship, my fellowship with God is good. We are still sinners who struggle with sin. And every single person who shows up in our church is the exact same. And for us to condescendingly look down upon somebody who is battling through sin, for those of us to look and to say, well, I think that person deserves even more sin or more punishment than God is willing to dole out on their life. Who am I? Where do I get off to say, I think God should punish them harder? God's, you don't know how God's punishing them internally through guilty conscience, through separation of maybe family members or situations that have occurred because of sin that has occurred and people have distanced themselves. But then we come along and say, yeah, we think it should be more. No, we are all, as we sit here, ought to be praying for one another, bearing one another's burdens because when it comes down to it, We are sinners who struggle with sin and need repentance to restore our fellowship with him. We ought to be praying for one another, praying for one another to repent, praying when we know that there are going to be individuals who are struggling and battling, praying for their help, praying for their help through addictions, praying for their help through battles of whatever the sin, the gossip, the nosiness, the busybody, the slanderer, all of those still sins. We need to be coming to God and asking for repentance. You know, we like loyalty programs, don't we? We like when we get our Kohl's cash back. All right, you know, it's the shopper math. All right, I saved $45 at Kohl's. They gave me $15 more, and now I can go spend another $60 because I saved $15, and I'll get more Kohl's cash next time. But we like the fact that they're giving us something for being loyal members. We We all like that. God expects loyalty. And he wraps up this passage with something again that seems completely different. You look and you're like, why, why are we ending here, God? What's, what's going on? Why are we going to all of a sudden talk about clothing and seams when we're dealing with sin and confession? Why, why do we get ourselves here? And he reminds us that the righteous will seek to remember the importance of loyalty to God. God says, I don't want to find you in high-handed sin. I don't even want to see you ignorantly going into sin. I want you to remember to walk with me. To remember to make me part of your everyday life. What's part of our everyday life? For 99.9% of the entire population, it's clothing. Okay, we, we wear clothing on a natural, normal basis. And God is gonna look and say, here's what I want you to do. Speak to the children of Israel, verse 38, and bid them that they make fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations that they put on the fringe a borders of a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. What is happening here? God's going to say to them, look, remember, I'm going to give you a big object lesson and I'm going to put it on mine and you're going to put it on yours. And when I walk by, you're going to see my fringe and I'm going to see your fringe. And what, it wasn't like, ooh, who had the nicer fringe? Ooh, who had the bigger fringe? Ooh, look at my blue ribbon. It's like much bigger than your ribbon. You know, it's like, that's not it. The purpose was that when you would see that, 
you would look and you would remember what? The commandments of the Lord and do them. So God was expecting loyalty from them. Our nature, though, look what he says. He says, and that you not seek after your own heart and your own eyes. The word to seek out or seek after is to spy out. It's the same wording that's used in chapter 13. When they spied out the land, when they went around, and he says, don't go spying out all the things that you personally want. You look and say, what does God want? What does God expect? You explore that. Loyalty, because loyalty by nature is not natural to anyone but who? Me. I like to be loyal to myself. I like myself getting what myself wants, not what you want. As much as I love y'all, I still am selfish. I still like loyalty to me. And that is what God's, don't, don't seek that out. You seek loyalty to God. He goes on, he says, to, to remember, to be, verse 40, he keeps moving forward. He says that you remember and do all the commandments and be holy unto God. Loyalty is a lack, uh, loyalty to self is a lack of loyalty to God. Did you see what he, he re, re, equates it to in verse end of verse 39? Which you do use to go a whoring. He uses it like equivalent to prostitution when I am just always seeking myself, my way, spying out mine, and forgetting God. Why would he say that? Because it's an unfaithfulness to God. God uses that throughout the Old Testament that we are in a covenant relationship, Israel, and you are prostituting yourselves. You are whoring after other things, and now in this case, yourself and your own ways and not after the ways of God. And God says this, this ribbon down here is supposed to remind you to look to remember the ways of God. Because if you're not focusing on God, if you're not putting things into your life to remember God, if you're not making him a practical part of every day of your life, you're going to find yourself drifting into careless sin. And ultimately, you may find yourself in situations where you're in utter rebellion against God. He implied that the idea here is to be holy or to do holy things, to live righteously before God. He says holiness is possible. He would not tell us to be holy if we could not be holy. We can strive toward holiness. It's the main purpose of loyalty, to be loyal to God so that we can be holy. Our loyalty and our holiness is to be driven by what? Look at verse 41. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. In other words, I've redeemed you and I deserve your respect because I am God. That's how he wraps it up. And when you put that in perspective, everything that has just happened with Israel, he is their God, but they said, no, we want to do our own thing. I have my ways. No, we want to go our way. I have my leader. No, we want our own leader. And you see all this high-handed rebellion in chapters 13 and 14 against God because they did what? They went, they spied out after themselves. They went a whoring after their own desires, their own loyalty program, not loyalty to God. And God says, put these, on your, put these on your clothing. Make it part of every day of your life. Do something in your home. Put something on the door on the way out. We have little signs around our house. We have, you know, in the morning, give me Jesus. Or we have, you know, a little sign over on the one talks about, you know, we want to be a blessing to others in our home. Have different things around your home, in your office, in your pocket. Pastor's done it a few times where he's given out erasers. He says, hey, just put it in your pocket so that when you reach down, you remember that. You're like, okay, I need to remember I'm praying for so-and-so or I'm going to do. Maybe you make it a point. We've done it with camp teens where you, you walk through a door and you say, every time I walk through a door, I'm going to praise God. or I'm go Make intentional efforts to do something in order to praise God, to remember God, to remember his ways, and to make him a practical part of everything in your life. Because disloyalty to God in this passage, it drives public and personal demise. It was what caused the catastrophe. And I think when you look at the fringes, it's a reminder, it's better to remember God's commandments than to violate them and to be found guilty. 
How can you intentionally remember God in your life? What are you doing on a daily, consistent basis to keep him at the forefront? Sadly, we live in a society that champions this cause. There is no authority but my authority. Don't tell me what to think about it through life. Little, little kids don't like to be told no. Teens want their independence. They begin to push back. They begin to rebel. Young adults and adults, we get to the point where we're like, we don't want an authority telling us what to do. I don't like laws. I don't like mandates. I don't like ordinances. I don't like any of that. Don't tell me what to do. I will know what's best for me, period. We like that. Even as you get into your senior years, you get frustrated with the fact that maybe some of your children have to now come and become almost like a mom or dad and begin to help. And they're going to tell you, no, you can't drive there. No, you can't do that. You need to do this. And we instantly find ourselves rebelling because, no, I'm the authority. I've been the authority in my life for 70 years. Don't come in and tell me what to do. We all battle with this thought that I am the only authority in my life. But how did God end this passage? He says, that is not true. He says, don't go after yourself. He says, I have redeemed you. And because I have redeemed you, and because I am God, I clearly have the right to command your obedience and expect your loyalty. It is completely antithetical to our philosophy in this world today. And we have to fight it. We have to internally fight and say, am I going to allow the world to sway me and I'll be my own authority and I'll do my own thing and if that means I end up finding myself in a position where I'm fighting against God, so be it. Or do we look and say, no, God, you are God. You have redeemed me with such a great price of your son. And because of that, because of your redemption and because of your position as God, I'm going to seek to do my best this week to be loyal to you, to remember you, and to live righteously and holy for you because you have the right to command me and you expect loyalty from me. It's hard to say. That's a hard look at life. But it's a real look. It's a biblical look that we all need to take. So take some time over the next moments in your home, in your car, and do some real examination and say, okay, loyal to God or loyal to myself? Father, I pray that you would help us, help me in my moments of rebellion and my intentionality to sin against you. God, I pray that you would forgive me. Lord, I pray that you would help me to have that proper fellowship with you. And God, I pray for everyone here who's listening. I pray that you would help them to seek to be loyal to you. Help us to find practical ways to do that in our life over this Thanksgiving and Christmas time. Help us to remember, and even just for the rest of our lives, God, to remember that you can expect it, you deserve it, and you can demand our loyalty. And Lord, help us to be loyal to you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much. Have a great day. We'll see you next time.